symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer himself, the greatest wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, double J Jeff Jarrett, Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Conrad Thompson. We had some stutter starts this morning. I'm fired up or I'm ready to go. We're into September, had a nice lake weekend, a little R and R football was up and down. We got lots to talk about with, um, just, just all, all kinds of topics today. I know we're going to dive in, but you know, our, our, our good friend, uh, Christopher Park, mm-hmm. um, is a, maybe a pot topic of discussion. I'll let you guide, uh, lots going on in the wrestling world. We are a, wow, a, about a weekend to the, uh, the McMahon's no longer, uh, owning, um, majority, uh, family business. So times are changing. Life is good. Life is busy. Kids going everywhere. Um, all good, pal. H- how are you doing? Uh, other than no belts in the bookcases, that's getting a little irritating. You know, one week after Starcast, I know you were busy and had to come home and, and, and get reacclimated and you had to do your deal two weeks. I think we're running on the third week. There's none of the, <sighs> The set looks empty, pal. Just there's a, there's a little bit of a, a, a lost feeling. I'm le- I'm leaving, Jeff. I'm moving. So you know. Oh, it's it's okay. beginning. So th- this is wow. Yeah, but I mean, listen. Here's the thing. I, I don't know where we get off starting the show on some. Oh, football's up and down. You know, I said to myself, self. <laughs> I wonder what the last outlaw is going to have to say about Florida just breaking an unranked Florida, just breaking it off in Tennessee, 29 to 16. And that score folks is not even really indicative of the ass whooping that that bumpkin Josh on the sidelines toted. I mean, it was downright embarrassing if we're honest. I mean, I was embarrassed for you. And then the audacity, I mean, you want to talk about resting on your laurels. When the rankings come out, Tennessee still ranked ahead of the team that took them to the woodshed. Like Tennessee is still ranked 23 where Florida is just now 25 after they beat you by multiple scores. I just, will your team ever recover? Or do you think you guys would just fold up tent for the rest of the season? Complete nonsense. I'm throwing a flag on your call just then. That is (laughs) unsportsmanlike conduct. Uh, we don't even have to go to, to the sideline to review the play totally out of line, uh, because context is king. Your crimson tide struggled and struggled. We won't even get into the Titans the, win. The number 13 crimson tide who picked up a win over the weekend, which is more than we could say <laughs> those lowly volunteers. Hold, hold on, hold on in wrestling, picking up a win over SD Jones. Is that really picking up a win? It was an unranked Florida, bud. It was an unranked Florida. They thought so highly of them. They ranked the top 25 and they said, that's enough. (laughs) Florida didn't make the cut. It isn't enough. It just every now and then there's a slip on the banana peel to set up the comeback. You got to get your loss like you guys did the week before. Wait, was A&M ranked? You mean Texas? Yeah, Texas was yes. ranked uh, like number 10 or 11. See, but that's Utah, who beat Florida, is also ranked number 11 right now. Uh, I just, I, I'll be honest, I'm worried about your team. I'm embarrassed no, for you. No, you're you not. come on this program. I had to listen to Rocky Chop. That's what <laughs> it is. So you, you got nervous because you, you're, you, you literally are trying to make uh, a mountain out of a molehill. It's a no. little slip up. It's, hey, Florida, that's our biggest rivalry. I'm sorry, than- Rocky, Rocky flop. Is that better? Oh, because that's what it was this past weekend. Speaking of flops, there's one thing you and I can agree on. Oh boy. And I want us to look right at that camera right now. <laughs> and I want you to know that we're talking to you personally, Chris Park, because when you look at the staggering amount of cash mm. that the Bengals were fleeced out of, <laughs> and they have just flushed this cash directly down the toilet. In the money they spent for Joe Clipboard to lose not one, but two back-to-back games. We like talking about the attitude era here. 
You could have had Bret Hart, the undertaker and stone cold for a year or old <laughs> Joey clipboard. Just taking an L. Have you ever seen, I mean, this is Johnny Manziel 2.0. Here's Worse. the amount of, here's the, here's his stat line. Worse. I, I've never seen anything like it. Listen, Joey clipboard watches film. Johnny Menzel, nope. He didn't watch any tape. So Joey Clipboard, what's that? I don't even have that calculator fired up, but we did a little math over the weekend. It was bad. <laughs> it was per two and a half million dollars that they spent it, to lose back to back weeks. That's playing some high dollar blackjack. A three and a half hour game, back to back Sundays. They went to the tables. Two point five million a Sunday. Let me just tell you this: against the Browns, his quarterback rating was fifty-two point two. <laughs> he completed forty-five percent of his passes. He had eighty-two yards, and then he let the lowly Bengals beat him. I mean, the lowly Ravens beat him. Mm. Threw an interception there, and what do you get for four hundred eighty-seven million dollars? 222 yards and a pick and a passer rating of 85.6. 85.6. cap his rookie year, my man did, had a 89.8 on the season. His, his sophomore year, you know, his second year in the league in 2021, 108.3. His, by the way, he's completing 68, 70 and 65% those years. Now this year he's completing 56% with a rating of 70.6. You made a bad bet, Chris Park. You made a bad bet. And, and you know, Conrad, we weren't running buddies uh, back in these days, but Abyss getting attached to a, a player. That's par for a course. Oh, it is. You can ask the fantasy football league. We've got a league. I don't know how many years in a row. I think I've won it 19 out of the last 17 years. But oh, I love those stats. It's 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 kind of amazing, and there's some commissioners, Eric Young, Rudy Charles, Matt Conway. They can all back this up. Abyss has a drafted a retired Tony Romo. Oh goodness gracious! A retired Pac-Man Jones. Oh no! He has come out in his second and third round fantasy league picks, picking a defense one year, a kicker another year. My gosh. And when he latched on to Joey Clipboard, I knew for certain that this guy's career was over. Rest in peace, Joey. Rest in peace. It's like the equivalent of being on the cover of the Madden game. <laughs> if Abyss says my favorite, if Abyss is like, do they have a Joe Burrow jersey I can buy in my size or I could customize my name on them immediately? Get that guy off your fantasy team. Yep. Start taking the under. That guy ain't never going to cover again. Never. The I'd highest paid quarterback in league history. And he's I'd open. pay good money to see Abyss wrestle Joe Burrow with there's thumbtacks. A black <laughs> hole slam right into the thumbtacks. That'd be the only way you could get me to watch anything with Joe Burrow. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you can get me to watch something. And I'm pretty proud of this, man. We've had a lot of fun over at adfreeshows.com. And we, we've started to spin off some new fun ideas. I'm sure you've at least heard about this. Some of our new shows. Well, there's a new one we've got called the false finish where we mm. talked to guys like Glacier and we had a great conversation with Wildcat, Chris Harris, and we just caught up not too long ago, uh, with Zach Gowan, but we've also done an insiders thing. And man, we've talked to a who's who most recently there was Dan Bynum posted, but I've got another one coming with a fabulous artist who helped create a lot of the iconic posters from the WWF days and their incredible costumes for guys like Razor Ramon and Papa Shango and so many others. But maybe my new favorite series is something we're calling Making the Town. We started with the ECW Arena, but we just posted one with the famed Dallas Sportatorium. Oh, wow. Take a listen to this exclusive clip as a world-class experience of a hostile takeover at the hands of one Mr. Jerry Jarrett. Let's take a listen. Watched that feud, the battle for world-class. And uh, it was almost surreal. 
to watch the world class banner be tore down in the sportatorium and be desecrated like that. Um, it was surreal. Uh, that building was synonymous with world class. That's all I knew from a distance. And I'm sure uh, if I felt that all the way up here in the Northeast, I'm sure those fans in Dallas felt the same way. So catch Banking the Town plus thousands of hours of other bonus content and do it now with this special offer. New subscribers can save 20% off their first month by going to adfree20.com. That's 20% off month one right now at adfree20.com. Today, Jeff, we're doing something totally different on the program. Wait a minute. Don't get in. Hold on. You know the old adage, if if I'm into it, there's a good chance other wrestling fans are into it? Yep. Did you even tee up who that was before for the audio listeners that might you not? You know what? You're right. I assume everybody's watching on YouTube. That's our great close personal friend, the Blue Mini. And the Blue Mini is a Philly. I love me some Mini. He's, he's yeah. fantastic, but he's born and raised in the Philly area, I believe. Yeah, so that's right. He's, he's watching. Man, your boy. Yes, he's watching WCCW World Class Championship Wrestling. Uh, I want to watch the rest of that. What what was really cool because I was obviously there for all that. I can remember my old man and Eric Embry kind of kind of laying this out, and I'm thinking, how it's just, it was it was a it was sitting under the learning tree of we're going to go tell this story, and they aligned the WCCD brand with Skandar Akbar, obviously the antagonist, the heel and all, all that goes with it. And there was mail-in campaigns. Anyway, it was a long episodic story, but they had the people in this auditorium in a hell of a house cheering like crazy to tear down that. It, it was, it was, uh, it was a fascinating story. So kudos Conrad to the ad free team. Um, that's really cool. And, have you not released or is it coming out? Are you talking about the guy, the graphic artist or creative services, uh, individual. Did I miss the name of that one or no? Tom Fleming. I was keeping it in my back pocket. I don't mind sharing though, but this is the guy who did the one, two, three kids gear, giant yeah. Gonzalez. Um, wow. Crush. Uh, so, so many of, of that era, but the Papa Shango stories and, um, Man, it's there's it. one story he's got about Mr. Perfect in there that is just almost make believe some really great insight into yeah. how the machine worked. You know, if you were an illustrator or a graphic artist, but like Razor Ramon was supposed to originally wear long tights, and that was the look, and that was what was approved, and that's what everybody went with. And then he just so happened to bump into Razor Ramon in the Titan gym. And I'll let him tell the story, but I'm telling you, man, there's so many cool insights in stories that we would never imagine would make the light of day, but they do because it's off the beaten path. It's not with someone we saw in front of the camera. It's someone who was behind the camera. We shine a light on that with the insiders. I think folks will absolutely love our conversation with Tom Fleming. Of course, everything we've talked about is posted now or coming to adfreeshows.com. Check it out. All the bonus contents there. You know, Conrad, we didn't mean to go into the rabbit hole, but we do here. Um, you know, nowadays it's, I mean, it's everywhere. YouTube, Twitter, you know, I'm saying the dirt or, yeah. but it, yeah. it's so, and I'm saying this respectfully, like you've taught me, it's a person's opinion. It's, yeah. it's not, and it's fun to talk about. I mean, you can watch any news station in, in the world and now really the sports ESPN and Fox sports and, and I mean, you get down even to granular level on smaller publications, it's all opinionated, which kind of drives a, a lot of things, but what you, what you're doing with ad free and our whole group here is that's the good stuff, man. The, 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 the real stories of behind the scenes of pulling the curtain back and the story behind the story. Hell, I want to watch that one too. So, all right, Conrad, m move on. I, but, but that, that's fascinating that he was going to wear long tights. I've never heard that. Dude, it's a really cool story. I think you'll dig it. Check it out. It's adfreeshows.com. And today we're going to be bouncing all over the place. We're going to like it because we're doing something we don't do very often here on the show. We're throwing you guys the keys to the show. Yes, we had a topic. Yes, we had notes. Uh, but I thought, man, you know what? There's been so much going on in wrestling in more recent weeks. 
we need to just get everybody together for what we like to call hashtag ask Jeff. Uh, but before we do, uh, we should remind everybody that with factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, the prepping and the cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Get 50% off with the code MYWORLD50 at factormeals.com slash MYWORLD50. That's factormeals.com slash MYWORLD50. And the promo code is MYWORLD50. Uh, man, you uh, you said it. We talked about it last week. This is going to be the beginning of the end of uh, the McMahon era. I can't believe that's the thing, but there's a real plan in place. And for, I don't know, decades of people speculating and guessing and wondering what is the succession plan going to be? Well, it involved a merger with the UFC to create the new company, TKO. Vince McMahon up there at the New York Stock Exchange doing the Hulk Hogan ear thing to the crowd. Quite a visual. Do rag and all. Well, I appreciate you and loving that Photoshop. <laughs> so listen, we we saw some of those layoffs start. Mm. Some of those departures start and you and I speculated and have been on the show that there are going, they are going to be able to create efficiencies when, you know, you have two big companies come together. We talked about some of those might be things like travel and HR and legal. Well, the first one down was Frank Riddick, who is the president and CFO. And I heard from a lot of people, I can't believe he's leaving. Then I thought to myself, self, how many CFOs do we really need? in this new company. So either way, don't cry for me, Argentina. My man's walking with 5 million bucks, uh, lots of other uh, big names who had, th- who headed up different departments uh, are no longer with the company. All told the rumor and innuendo is that there were over a hundred releases and perhaps more to come. I'm wondering what effect, if any, do you think that has on the pro wrestling world? I think Change is good. Change is positive. Uh, it's not easy to swallow some folk to some folks, but, and look, uh, I know Frank personally, a good dude, man. Uh, been in meetings. He's just a, a good man. Um, I'm sure Frank is very happy, uh, for his entire career. He goes back a ways there. They leaned into him a couple of times over the last, uh, well, th- throughout his really career but they really leaned in a couple of times i'd say over the last three to five years uh and there are others and 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 look it's it, it it's it's the natural progression uh, don't let me forget conrad i want to come back to the dana white epstein kind of um point of discussion that they were on opposite sides of the fence but how will the layoffs affect the pro wrestling industry will or will they I mean, I don't know that they will necessarily. Do they have oh, to? Oh, it just, I think everything's relative. Uh, you know, could it be small, you know, medium or large? I think it's got a good shot of being at least a medium because when you have skilled professionals that have know how, that have been in the biggest sports entertainment conglomerate ever assembled that has been around for years and years, and you just have to look at their stock and their dividends and their profits to uh, ask yourself, are are they successful or not? So they've done a lot more things right than wrong. And I'm sure the good businessman learns more from the decisions that were made wrong than right. So I think there's a lot of wisdom on the open market right now, I think is the best way to say. And I think it is going to be up to um, all promotions, uh, around the globe. Do they want to tap into that wisdom? Uh, whether it's a full-time, a consultant, um, whatever it may be, but I think it's a huge, huge upside, uh, for the wrestling business as a whole, including the WWE, because the merger, like you said, you don't want to duplicate spots. And and that's the reality. Uh, Frank didn't do anything wrong. And the other folks, none of them did anything wrong. Matter of fact, they did a lot of things, right. Uh, but you know, I hate to call always my old man used to always call him bean counter. So I almost did that, but anybody in finance, um, look, he, he ran the WWE books. Well, now you got somebody that's got to run the endeavor books, not just the UFC. So, um, anyway, congrats. Uh, I'm sure condolences because loss of anything, whether it's life or job or friendship or relationship, uh, th- it is a trying time until you come out the other side of it. But I can, uh, tell you, 
from experience, multiple examples. Uh, any valley uh, is is just in the process of creating that mountaintop. So I wish you everyone well. Head up, and there is a boatload of opportunity in front of you, but you got to go grab it. Dude, I love your perspective on that because we've talked about your ups and downs through your career and life here on the program. And you're right. Uh, every time it feels like the world from the outside looking in had old double J counted out, he came back bigger and better and stronger than ever. So I'm pulling for those folks and hope that, uh, this is just their Valley before their next big peak. And man, we had a lot of conversation online. I guess it was about two weeks ago. Oh, hold on Conrad. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you see, cause I don't, I don't know if you're moving on from the subject. Are you moving on from the UFC? WWE? We'll talk about whatever you want, daddy. It's your show. No, the, the, the Dana White Epstein. Oh. Epstein comment. Yeah. Yeah. What's your take on that? Now, I guess to catch everybody up, I'm going to paraphrase. Yeah. Epstein said something like, you know, we see a world where eventually we'd like to get to where every WWE fan is a UFC fan and every UFC fan is a WWE fan. And I'm sure he felt like there was crossover. And once upon a time, I did believe there was a lot of crossover. I think as time has gone on, there is less and less, but certainly you look at guys like uh, Brock Lesnar and Ronda Rousey. I mean, certainly Conor McGregor is a natural born sports entertainer. There's other names that would, that would check that list. I mean, just looking at the current roster today, Shayna Baszler, uh, Mr. Riddle, there's a bunch of talent who could make it there. Uh, if their MMA career is over one day, but Dana White came out and said, that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. <laughs> so Conrad, th this is what's bizarre. I heard. I can't say it's completely different. I thought Epstein's point was we want to create synergies on mega weekends, pay-per-view weekends, whether yes. it's a Friday night event for UFC and a Saturday night event uh, for WWE or Saturday, Sunday, or whatever right. it be. I thought not only yes, but hell yes. That'd be huge. It is to, I, I believe for the majority, it is two separate fan bases, but you have one load in one up and down. I'm talking about from a production point of view, you, you're in one arena. You have just like the synergies of finance and HR and administrative and accounting and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, their place of work is in one town, not two. And so there's a lot of, uh, situations where I think there's an upside and I also think you can just own the town, go see UFC Friday, go see WWE Saturday. Cause it really is for the most part, two different audiences. I thought that's a, I, and I think we're going to see that. I, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to flush out, but you know, I'm not going to say a mania weekend or a summer slam or survivor series, the big four, so to speak. I don't think it's going to happen on those weekends, but let's just take, you know, what was the latest one payback in Pittsburgh or whatever it was. I can see a Friday, Saturday uh, with that because there's so many events. I think, I think it can create a whole new kind of branding uh, initiative with a lot of upside and you can have the occasional, you know, we'll call it a fan fest uh, where yes. you have, you Both. know, yes, all under one roof. I think there's a lot of ways to monetize that. So I just thought it was interesting. If not the day that they merged the day after, <laughs> Epstein and Dana are on polar opposite sides. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, is that the message you want to put out right away? But all fun. We're in the fight game. So uh, conflict uh, creates. Oh, so anyhow, go ahead, Conrad. No, I, I, I think it's great for the industry a whole. I do. I think it's great for AEW. I think it's great for all any and everything. And I don't put them in the same bucket. I think it's great for MMA. And I think it's great for professional wrestling. Can you imagine how exciting it would be if the UFC used WWE production, like as far as the staging and the, the ramp and the, the video boards and all that, like people, UFC fans would lose their mind with that level of presentation. It's, and I, and I think we're going to see it. I think it's uh, in, in a lot of ways. And I've said this going back three generations, you know, in professional wrestling, uh, wink, wink. We control wins and losses and presentations and storylines and everything that goes with it. And in the UFC, they don't have that luxury, so to speak. And so it is always a different game. It literally is. What are we going to promote? Because they don't create Conor McGregor's every day. You got to kind of capture that lightning in a bottle. Uh, whereas, you know, you, you don't, 
create a John Cena overnight, but man, you can uh, create one and, you know, shoot, he came back last couple of weeks ago. They're riding that. Rock came back riding that. Um, that that's what's really cool. You you can utilize past stars in such a monstrous way. Yeah. Um, you see that Rock video? All Over 100 million impressions very quickly. 22 million in TikTok in like hours. Yeah, I mean, over the weekend, over a hundred million impressions just from that. And of course, you know, I think there was even a quote out there from Batista. You know, Rock and Batista can't do much right now. There's a writer strike. Hollywood's shut down, so there is going to be some opportunity. That's going to lead to lots of debate. I do want to ask you about the Rock and WrestleMania, just hypothetically. But before we get there, I wanted to circle back to something we were talking about, like. On the one hand, I think it would be awesome as a cost-saving measure, like you're saying, use that same arena, just tear down the wrestling ring and set up the UFC cage. Then you could certainly use the WWE video boards and all that stuff. But man, I saw something that said that WWE's top line growth so far this year is higher than UFC's, but UFC had more than double the profit which means you've got to create some economies of scale. You got to create some efficiencies. You want WWE to be percentage wise as profitable as UFC, if that can be done. Well, one of the things you got to think that they would be looking to save on is that presentation, the production, because it is such a monstrous expense for WWE to buy all that stuff, to set it up, to tear it down, to truck it, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think removing, I've heard before that just one extra truck is something like 350 grand a year in cost savings just by taking one less truck. Not talking about the shit in it, just the truck moving around. It's going to cost, it's going to save you like a boatload of cash. So I'm just thinking, do you think there's a way? Is it possible? Is it conceivable that wrestling starts to feel a little more old school? Like UFC guys just walk out of a tunnel now. And I used to love the idea that the WWF back in the day when I grew up, they have that light, that giant lit logo, the WWF. And then the guys just walk through. That was awesome to me. And I know now it maybe is almost overproduced because we've got the huge staging, but we've spoiled wrestling fans on that. Can we go back to the way it used to be? That would represent a huge cost savings. Or is it more likely that UFC just uses the WWE stuff? The business never goes backwards. They're not. And why would they? And, and look, I, I'm not a, a financial wizard and dig it into everything, but w- when you text me that, I don't know, we were talking or texting and all that. The first thing that came to my mind is I'd love to do a breakout of talent cost. And I'm going to defend UFC or the MMA game because they pay the fighters on the card and that's their cost. But in professional wrestling land you have a big lick so to speak because it's a perfect example here of cena a past guy who's not full-time you've you've got one-offs you've got logan paul you got bad bunny you got all these different things that you know so the profitability um you know it isn't there and i i know they're beholden to the bottom line but that's one of the things that they're going to get in there and figure out. I'm I'm sure that if they can enhance the UFC production, which they will, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, because when you really look at the, the uh, you know, I'll call it the brand um, Q rating, maybe the best way, there's just probably get heat for saying there's just no comparison. I mean, double, you, they're both global brands, but, Look at the, the, you know, football, basketball, baseball combined doesn't really make WWE. It just, it, the, I don't think we're really comparing apples to apples when you did get into it. I think they merged. They're going to be smart about it. Uh, but there's, in my opinion, there's no way production's going to go in reverse. Nothing goes in re- reverse. Uh, I do think there's a, a chance that, you know, maybe there's a, a way to utilize the UFC legends um, in, in a different role. And maybe those legends may be some crossover, uh, in, in one-offs or something like that. I, I just think, you know, the, their business models are different. 
you know, the fight game is different than the professional wrestling game. I know I sound repetitive, but no, Conrad, I don't think they're going backwards in production. Can you imagine a George St. Pierre tag match in Montreal? Yes. Bingo. I they mean, George, George St. Pierre with Kevin Owens. And yes. Sami Zayn and a six man tag against, you know, the bloodline or some such shit, judgment day or whatever. That'd be unbelievable. You could fantasy book so many different things. I mean, a, a you know, Back in the territory days, when you brought in a guest special referee, and they've done it with, uh, we did it in Dallas with Leon Spinks, but they did it with uh, uh, Joe Frazier. They've done it, you know, over and over and over. Professional athletes used to step in, you know, in their off season and be the special referee or the special enforcer. You know, I think there's going to be so many opportunities how to integrate them in. Um, I, I, it's going to be interesting on the tipping point, whatever that may be, because. Logan Paul, uh, above and beyond. I mean, a bad bunny, um, you know, on a much small, you know, the, the guys that step into the world, somebody's going to lay an egg. And I think that'll put the, uh, uh, I, I think it will give some celebrities, former athletes, a little trepidation, like, Oh boy, that didn't turn out well for that celebrity or that ex athlete. I'm not sure I want to dive into it, but right now it's the shiny object all over the, all over the globe. So let's talk about WrestleMania. Um, because that's, that's the next big event. And I want to talk about the Hollywood effect But before we do that. You mentioned Logan Paul and we're about a month away from him fighting Dylan Dennis and KSI fighting Tommy Fury. And this is essentially like a prime fight. If you will, of course, KSI and Logan Paul are partners in prime. I think they have a third partner who's actually driving the business, but still they're the big brand influence that's got this beverage company hotter than ever out of nowhere, uh, with a B billions with a B, but along the way, they're going to promote this fight, of course. And I think a lot of people assumed KSI and Tommy Fury, he, him being the younger brother of Tyson Fury, boy, that's going to get everybody hot and bothered. We saw the tight, the, um, the Tommy Fury, Jake Paul fight. I don't expect this will be any different. I think, you know, Paul's just, I mean, um, KSI has got no shot against Tommy Fury, but what everybody's talking about is not that quote unquote main event. It's the undercard with the way Dylan Dennis has been promoting the fight against Logan Paul. He's pulled out all the stops. He's become the ultimate Twitter, Twitter troll. Just really going after Logan's fiance who I guess is a public person and a model as well. But I'm curious to see if you've caught any of that and what you think of that promotion, because I don't know that anybody was even caring or interested in that fight, but because of the social media aspect, it's now super hyped, super popular, super viral. And I do a podcast every week that comes out on Tuesdays and the old wise man on that show has been saying pretty consistently Young guys in this wrestling business need to understand the power of social media. That's how you promote. And that's how you get over. I don't know if Dylan Dennis is a listener, but boy, has he done it. What do you think <laughs> of the job Dylan has done? And, and in your opinion, has it gone too far? You do a much better, uh, much better job of me uh, uh, phrasing that. Can you peel one layer of the onion back? How would you, uh, for example, what is his um, mission statement on Twitter to promote this fight uh, in regards to the fiance? Cause I got a, a little story here. So just so everyone knows, cause I know where there's a lot of just hardcore wrestling fans listening. Dylan Dennis is a multiple time jujitsu world champion, but the most recent time he fought was four years ago. And since then he's developed a bit of a reputation amongst naysayers where people would say, oh, he's going to no show. He's not going to show up. He's going to pull out of the fight. He's not a real fighter. He's got all these excuses, blah, blah, blah. He gets booked for this fight against Logan Paul and Logan Paul goes as hard as you can, or Dylan Dennis does at Logan's fiance. And he made it his mission to post pictures of his fiance with other, other guys. Nothing scandalous, just anyone she's ever posed for a picture with, with the implication being this is bro code. Are you sure you want to do this Logan? 
And of course, really, it's just goading him into a fight. As silly as this sounds, if you haven't been paying attention to this, in the month of August, he had over 2 billion impressions on his posts. It resulted in a lawsuit, a real deal lawsuit, where now Logan's fiance is suing Dylan. Now, when I say real deal, I mean it was actually filed in a courthouse. I don't know how far they're going with this promoting, but I know for sure Dylan is selling his ass off on this fight. And it's not so much about the two guys as it is one guy is very clearly trying to position himself as a heel. It's wrestling, Jeff. Oh. So my brother-in-law, about a month ago, we're talking about maybe high school football or catching up or whatever, and he's like, hey, man, have have you – speaking of Logan Paul, have you – and Conrad, this is how he does it. hmm. So, Jeff, have – do you know anything about this Logan Paul fight? And I said, nope. And so he goes on to explain it. And (laughs) – he may get it's, he, he it's may get, but then he goes on to explain he's like I, I just I you know and I'm I'm trying to do an impersonation of him because he could not get the question out because he's like in his mind, okay, Jeff's in professional wrestling. I've been in the family for 20 years, 20 over 25 years. I probably should know this, maybe I shouldn't know this. And he's like is this stuff real? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, and, and I go, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. And he's like, man, it is heavy. And I said, well, you know, you, you never know. I said, but they are driving toward a fight. And he's like, yeah, man, but man, they're going deep on this stuff. It's over and over and over. I took it, it that it was super scandalous that they were v- revealing Jeff, he's, he said he has video of Logan's fiance doing things that you don't want to see your fiance doing before she knew you, but it's hype. I mean, there, there's no been, there's no been, come on, man. Of course it is. And that's, what's great is there's no stake here. So, so far it's just, they're, they're, they're doing promos back and forth. Right. But anyway, yes, finish my story in the gym, not once, but twice. That was just last week. So there is water cooler talk built around this. Yes. Over and over and over. And I'm thinking, my man, Logan, is a machine. And I say a machine, a marketing machine. I'm pretty proud that. So is the judge Stanley Blackburn or Jack Tunney? Do you know which judge is presiding over this case? I I, I don't know who the judge is, but I appreciate what you just said, because all I could think. And I saw it on TMZ that she had filed lawsuit against him because I guess what she, what she did or what, what he did is he had someone hack into her Snapchat. Oh, or that's the story. Oh goodness. And she looks right at the camera and talks about all these different things. She'd like to see happen. You don't really want to hear those things. No one should have seen that. And then allegedly there was a video of her playing flute, maybe, I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff out there now. And so it was logical that she would file suit. Well, I heard once upon a time that macho man was such a stickler that if any fan went down to the courthouse and looked to see, well, they'd find out what was really going on with him and miss Elizabeth because they carried it all the way. And so I just thought when I saw that on TMZ and these guys have figured it out because again, I want to repeat what I just said there. One man's Twitter. He has, he has 900,000 followers. Now he had a lot less than that when the month of August started, but one man on Twitter with 900,000. So less than a million had over 2 billion impressions, billions with a B in August. I love it. And so Jeff, I want to ask you, uh, what station and what time can we see Dylan on network TV? Does he come on on Mondays? Or is that Wednesdays or is that Fridays? He's not on TV at all. Y'all. He doesn't have one segment on TV whatsoever. Your point. His Twitter got 2 billion impressions. So I know there's a lot of people out there who think in order to be successful in wrestling, you have to have a three, uh, your match has got to go three segments and you got to be in a crossover. Oh my gosh. And you got, and it's like, wait, wait, wait. These guys have water cooler talk at the gym in real life. 
without one television clearance. Bingo. It's not on TV at all. They're posting shit to YouTube. That's free. They're posting shit on social media. That's free. The paid advertising. I'm sure there's an advertising budget for this, but what they've done on social media. I mean, if you went and you asked like a Darren Ravel, what the social media, the advertising value of just Dylan Danis's Twitter last month was, it would be unbelievable. And it was free. And all I could think was, is this is Jeff. Jeff has said, this is exactly what to do. And whether you got to troll the guy on his fiance's questionable past, whether or not that's true, who knows, or murder a grandpa in a parking lot in Nashville, you just got to do what you got to do. Damn right. So we are, we, I, I guess we are in our topic because it's asked Jeff anything. I it guess is, it I, is. I got to fire back at you. Prime time is running wild. Oh my gosh. And you know what? I know, I know this for sure. Before you get going on him every single day, I have it on good authority. The Deion Sanders wakes up and takes one scoop of AG one and a cup of water. That's it. And that's all it took for him to get all momentum on his side. He needs that immune system support because everybody's wanting to shake his hands right now. He needs better gut health because sometimes his kids are going to have to pull it out in double overtime. And you know, he needs a boost of energy because everybody expects him to stay hype when he's got offset and the rock on the sidelines. And maybe he hates taking pills or vitamins, or maybe he just wanted a supplement that tastes great. Well, AG one is prime time for you, baby. Do it on your way to work out. Do it just to start your day. My wife tells me on her way to the gym every day, if she misses a day, she can tell she's not as productive at the gym. I know I'm not as productive at the office without it. In the afternoon, I feel like I'm losing focus. I can't really be as effective as I normally would be. With AG1, all that changes. They replace your multivitamin, your probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. It's a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced superfoods and nutrients. 75 different ingredients in total to help support your energy, your focus, your strength, and your clarity. Think of it as like a all in one nutritional insurance. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG one, get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG one travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to drink AG one.com slash my world. That's drink AG one.com slash my world. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. So yeah, man, let's talk about prime time. Deion Sanders has his cats ready to roll, man. They somehow are three and oh, ticket prices are through the roof. He sold over a million dollars worth of sunglasses just this past weekend. Uh, he had, uh, one of his sons just tear up the football field at quarterback, an unbelievable stat line for him. Yes. He had an interception, but if you watched it, eh, almost a fumble. And then the other kid, man. Pick six, who to thunk it. It's really remarkable to see what he's been able to do in a very short period of time. He's got the fan base motivated. He's got, you know, the ticket prices through the roof. He's got the attention of the mainstream media. I mean, everybody set up their game day shows in Colorado. That's the first time that they've done that in probably decades, but he faces two back-to-back -back challenges now, Jeff. It's no longer just a, a chippy Colorado state as an in-state rival. And yes, they won, but they were a 24 point favorite and won it in a double overtime and then stormed the field. I know the hype train is here. But a lot of the naysayers, Jeff, they say that comes to an end this weekend against Oregon or next weekend against USC. But at the same time, nobody thought they would beat both Nebraska and TCU, but they did. What say you? Can you keep it going against Oregon and USC? Or is it all hype? I say this with all diplomacy. I don't really care. Yeah. I, I am so fascinated that, you know, primetime was the guy that he was a sports entertainer. Not a, obviously not a professional wrestler in that vein, but he's been entertaining in sport since college. Yeah. And he just kind of broke the mold. And I remember when he went to the Cowboys and I'm just thinking, man, that team is just ready made for him, but he was a star at Florida state. He he's always marketed himself. 
And did you see the piece on 60 Minutes last night, Conrad? Loved it. Don't miss an episode of 60 Minutes. I'm a nerd. Hey, okay. I've always loved that show. But the piece on it, man, he gave flowers to your man Saban, which I love, which I absolutely love. But, you know, when you kind of drill back and he says, hey, we gave 15 staffers and this and that, and the interview was fascinating. And he does got a little old school in there because he's very disciplined. But and he's got new school and and everything, but man, he is a leader that's selling hope. And, and, and I think it's just super cool to, to see how it's come out. And you kind of stole my line in there that we're talking about Logan Paul, you know, the opposing coach, this is where my head goes. Conrad did, did, did Dion call up the coach opposing coach and say, Hey man, take a dig about my glasses. I want to sell some glasses that I, I know that's maybe a little far fetched, but that opposing coach, I mean, just walked up to, to, to Dion and family and opened up a Brinks truck because the comments of those people that don't know, Dion Sanders beat T, uh, TCU which was in the college national championship game last year. They upset them game one. He walks into a press conference, blah, 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 blah. after game two beating Nebraska, he walks in with a hat on and sunglasses on in the press conference. So going into this week, the opposing coach wants to get, get, get his team maybe fired up and said, I was taught by my mother that when you talk to adults, you take your hat off and your glasses off. Dion spun that around and made the speech about, okay, this guy made it personal. He's talking about my mama and he's talking about sunglasses. And Oh, by the way, I've got a brand of sunglasses. And so I'm going to about talk about it. Ah, I sold 1.1, 1.2 million in a day. It, it's just fascinating. You know, the, the Logan Paul fight, just how all that is done organically via social media. Because it wasn't like, you know, yes, the sports centers and the Fox Sports of the world, that they put it out there. But it was all over social media. Uh, we just live in a fascinating time, don't we, Connie? I mean, it's just, it's crazy how all that just, you know, we weren't even really thinking about, I don't know. Hey, isn't it cool that Dion's quarterback, it's one of his sons is, is, is the great quarterback. Dion Jr. is... Safety. But... What's what's the kid's name who's running the production side of things? That's yeah, so he's got one kid running the social, doing all the YouTube videos and things like that. <laughs> yes. And and another kid as a safety wearing number twenty one, doing pick sixes. And the other kid throwing for, I don't know, four hundred yards a game. <laughs> like ladies, if you're paying attention, uh, you should go find John Jones mama. Uh I mean, my goodness. The the Deion Sanders and what he has put together out there, whether you love him or you hate him, it's changed the culture and it's invigorated a fan base and it's good for college football. So I, for one, am excited to see it. And I'm excited to finally ask you my WrestleMania question. Okay. Here we we go. are going to let everybody else have their chance to ask questions. we got tons. There's no way we'll get to them all, but there's been a ton of debate now because boy, the, uh, the gurus online, they've got it figured out. Of course. The rock is going to wrestle Roman reigns at WrestleMania, but as okay. you know, WrestleMania is a two night affair. So a lot of people are wondering, what do you do? If you got John Cena hanging around and you got the rock and you got Roman and you got Cody and oh, by the way, Seth Rollins has that other belt and LA Knight's running around lots of people wondering, uh, what are they going to do? What would you do for WrestleMania? You got two nights. Conrad, I'm, I'm obviously unprepared, uh, A, but B, you're, you're kind of throwing a broad net. Like, can you narrow your question? Because, like, what would you do? Like, main events? Yeah, so the question is, you know, listen, a lot of people believed, and, and Rock confirmed it with Pat McAfee last week in Colorado, that we were supposed to have seen Rock and Roman at WrestleMania this year in LA and so far and rock agreed that, yeah, that, that was the plan. We agreed to it. We shook on it. And then there was no creative that excited him and made him want to do it. So they went with Cody and Roman instead. And so now he says he wants to do something that's unprecedented. I don't know what that means. 
but he wants something that could get fans excited. So now this has built to a big debate because a lot of people believed Cody Rhodes, quote unquote, finishing the story would be Cody versus Roman at WrestleMania. And now others say, well, it's the 25th anniversary of the rocks. First WrestleMania main event. It's in Philadelphia, the same town. Maybe it makes sense. Rock versus Roman. But man, we're still so far away from the writer's strike. And Rock says this has nothing to do with injuries or schedules. You know, injuries are just part of it. And I control my own schedule. That's not the issue. It's got to have the right creative. And I asked Kevin Sullivan about this a few months ago. And he said if it were up to him, he would have Cody wrestle Roman on night one. And then him wrestle rock on night two. I talked to somebody else who's pretty smart in the wrestling business. And they said, maybe the move is you have them wrestle twice, both Cody and Roman. Maybe one guy rest, maybe Cody wrestles John Cena on night one and rock wrestles Roman on night one. And then Cody and Roman wrestle on night two. And I saw an even third person, another smart person who won't say their name said I'd do a three way. And I would have Cody pin the rock to win the world title. That way you had a return. So Roman could say you didn't beat me. And that becomes your SummerSlam match. And maybe the following year, you know, Roman and rock wrestle in a singles blow off. And that's it. I don't know, but you've booked a lot of wrestling in your day. What would you do with Cody rock and Roman? Creative is subjective. Sure. As we, as we know that, and this is really, wow. Uh, off the top of my head. So I'm not sure I'm buying that rock was uninspired going into so far this year. Uh, we all know what happened the day after yeah, it so, was a money thing. Uh, well, I, well, I, I just think there's a, there, there, there's a, there, there was a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, Vince coming back, the, 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 the sale, the merger, you know, the executive situation, um, the, the, the WWE over the last 12 months, when you really think about it, if you want to pull in 18 months, how much think about that, Conrad, I mean, wow, lots of changes. Yes. Yeah. Lots of changes. So I, I can kind of see in my man, Dwayne, uh, second and third generation going, you know, there's a lot more upside to having a little patience. I'm going to set this one out for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and that, so, okay, now Endeavor and UFC and maybe the writer strike, maybe not, I doubt it, but maybe there's something there that excites him. So kind of off the top of my head, I would go, cause you got to move mountains. I could give you a couple of Memphis stories that, you know, my old man would get an opportunity to get a date on even an idol. Uh, you know, I'm not saying Coon comparative, but you know, to get a special talent that you don't have full time, you do change plans. It it's 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 the nature of the beast. You 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 got to go for your bottom line. How can I make the most money? So do you do Rock and Roman on one night, and on the other night, Cody? has to finish the story, and I hate to use this line, but I think it is the most appropriate that I can come to my mind is that your father-in-law's adage, to beat the man, to be the man, you got to beat the man. That's right. So if Cody is really going to be the baby face, face of the company, all doors have to go through Cena. So you go Cody Cena on the other night and you give them the finishes that whatever needs to be done. And, and that's that, that, that to me, it, God almighty, what a, what a, that's a, that's a big ass back to back. That's a whew, Cena on one night rock on the other. I mean, what do you do, right? I just think it's huge. I mean, I, I, that off the top of my head, that's how you make the most money. Well, we're going to talk a lot about how to make the most money on this program. That's what we spend a lot of time talking about. But one of the things that I had a great 
amount of fun with about two or three weeks ago, probably two weeks ago at this point. Oh boy. Is someone posted on social media and I forget who, but it became a thing. Boy, I was today years old when I learned that Jeff Jarrett's WWF gear was supposed to be guitar strings. Now, a lot of people have poked holes in that and said, well, he he used it in USWA, so that can't be right. But the design we're talking about are the quote unquote Venetian blinds. That's that's your term. That's your term. So, you know, you know, which ones we're talking about. I think Eric Bischoff once called it your dick dancer outfit. Mm but this is the original double J ring gear. And I guess your top, a lot of people believe now was supposed to be guitar strings. I had never heard that before. And I think our man, one of mine and your favorite follows on Twitter, uh, Andrew says, Nope, he used it in USWA. So set the record straight. Were those straps supposed to simulate or emulate guitar strings? You know, they're my, my seamstress back in the day. So, uh, her husband, oh my gosh, I'm going to, um, draw a blank, but her husband, uh, played on the Grand Ole Opry for like 30 or 40 years and made she made all kinds of, I'll call it seventies, uh, Porter Wagner over the top, uh, kind of outfits, uh, in the country music space. So that I was looking for something that, that, that was over the top, that was flamboyant, that, that wasn't, you know, I'll call it just short, 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 uh, short, tight, short boots, the the traditional wrestler, but to say it was part of, um, my first wife, Jill and, oh God, Miss Collins. I cannot think of that country. Anyway, they're, they're the ones that, that drew up a bunch of things. And I said, let's go with that one. It, it had straps, but to say it was guitar strings, man, that's a great story to go with, but not true. Well, there you go. Straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, let's do another question here. Uh, speaking of Ian, Ian drew dice clay, but hold, hold one, one second uh, on that. What's so that was done in 92. I did some dark matches for the WWF in 92 and I wore those in that. Well, fast forward to 93 when I'll call it just kind of the time was right. Vince and my father got together. Uh, it was time, you know, to, to go to WWE. That was what they decided. So going into that, they're like, okay, let's, let's kind of figure out you know, what is that character going to be? And we've gone on that end uh, ad nauseum, you know, so double J Jeff Jarrett and he spells his name and Bruce and Vince having that conversation. But it, at the time in the nineties country music, it was, it was red hat with the hat act, red hot with the hat acts and all that. But I just kind of look back and go, okay, that outfit was way before double J the country music star was created, but it kind of fit in that whole vein. Um, I'll call it the grand weaver woven outfit long before double J was really created. So another question here from, uh, Ian drew dice clay. If you had the pick of the WWE, AEW and impact roster to do a TNA one night stand pay-per-view, oh boy. what matches would you book and what location would you use for an authentic TNA at its best card in 2023? So listen, we're not going to book the whole card, but it is interesting. If you were going to do sort of the ECW equivalent of a one night stand, would it make sense to do it at the fairgrounds at the impact zone or somewhere else? You know, if the uh, fairgrounds arena, which they tore down to build the soccer stadium was still open, that would be the natural. Um, I think you could go to the um, impact zone, but you couldn't monetize it. We, a lot of people are are not aware, but we did episodes three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine and 10 in the municipal auditorium, the scene of Ric Flair's last match. You know, I, I just think the municipal auditorium would probably, it's in Nashville, would probably the best location you can monetize it the best 
uh, maybe market it the best. You know, the impact zone near and dear to my heart, but it's 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 much harder and a much less lower gross. So I'll go with the municipal auditorium, Conrad, on that. Let's not pick the whole card, but give me, we'll call it three matches. You're going to do, uh, again, it's an ECW one night stand type tribute show. So we're going to put together some of our more iconic acts against each other and the oh, spiritual wait, home. We go back in time or do they have to be active wrestlers now? Well, I mean, we didn't have a time machine in 05. I'm not saying that to be bust your balls. I'm saying they had to do with what they had. So we had, you know, Sandman and Tommy dreamer against the Dudley boys in the main event, but we had guys like Jericho who was available and he could come in and we had guys like Ray Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. And then some acts we hadn't seen in a long time, like Mike awesome and Masato Tanaka. So in that vein, guys who could put on gear and get ready today in 2023 at the municipal auditorium, we know you're on the card. What's your match look like? What would AJ be doing? Talk me through any of those hypotheticals. Oh, hypothetical. So is it called impact or TNA? You're, you're booking it. So, I mean, he said it would be a TNA one night stand. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I just, to me and my, we've talked about it. I think there's the TNA years, um, which are much different than the impact years. And then you get into the, uh, we'll call it the Corgan years and the Anthem years and blah, 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 blah. So the TNA years, you, you just, you, you gotta go with Kurt. Yep. You gotta go with AJ. I know Bobby Roode injury wise, but Bobby and Bobby Roode and Eric Young, Chris Harris and James Storm. Yep. You know what? I, I, okay. So you said three matches. Yeah. I'm just give me three hypotheticals. AJ Styles versus Christopher Daniels versus Samoa Joe. Oh, I love that. Duplicate the three way that really yeah. was the first X division to main event a pay per view. I, 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 ju- I think that's there. I think you could probably do something along the lines of America's Most Wanted, Motor City Machine Guns versus the Young Bucks. Hmm. Trying to think of another tag team that would uh, maybe uh, I'm just trying to think of an eight man tag that would just, um, you know, Elix Skipper. Did we find Elix and Loki? Dude, I was, when you said Elix Skipper, I just assumed you're going to put Elix Skipper and Christopher Daniels together. I didn't see that with Samoa Joe. That works. But do you yeah, put just, Elix thought, and Low Key and the Bucks against Motor City Machine Guns and America's Most Wanted? Dude, that, that's Eight crazy. Minutes. One more match. You haven't done anything. Put yourself in one. Where's Kurt Angle? Okay, hey, look, and I know I'm going to miss somebody here because uh, I, I love Road Dog and Truth and Conan, and they're going to be somewhere on the card because I'm just trying to think of that seven year kind of bill. But I think you got to go Christian, Kurt, Abyss, myself, and this is really going to get he. I got to figure a fifth guy in a king of the mountain match. <laughs> of course. I wonder who wins <laughs> R- Raven or sting. Who's the other guy going in there? Yeah. Hey, no sting. I didn't. Yes. Sting. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. That's a fun question and a fun little exercise. And I don't know why you have such a hard on for Kurt angle, but I'm glad you do because of blue chew boys and girls. Let's talk about sex. Remember the days when you're always ready to go. Well, now you can increase that performance in bed to think of it as a PED for your wiener meat. Yeah. Blue cheese is going to deliver you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take these dudes anytime day or night. So you plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. 
And the process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Bluetooth wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluetooth.com. Chew it and do it. Y'all. We got a special deal for our listeners. Try blue chew free. When you use our promo code, my world to check out, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code my world to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast and Jeff's Wiener. All right. So, Jeff, let's get back to it. Sean Reedy had a great question. I'd love to hear all his memories of facing Bachwinkle for the AWA title in Memphis. That must have been nerve wracking. Nerve wracking is well said, my friend. Uh, your question. And uh, as you teed it up, you know, I was 19. And I'm working with a guy 51. Uh, it just, it was uh, surreal. Yes, nervous. I wanted to make sure that I did everything he told me to do. But uh, as I've learned through the years, those kind of bur- butterflies and that kind of nervous only enhance your uh, performance in so many ways. But what a pro. Um, it's something that, you know, in, in, in today's world, Guys, I just, I'm blessed I got that opportunity because it was nerve wracking, but kind of nothing replaces being in a ring with someone who dictates we're going to listen to the people. And I know it's a different era and I get we're in the TV era and and everything that goes with that, but you can still do bits and pieces of that uh, on independent shows. I went to an independent show this past weekend, uh, took my man codes out to the Tennessee state fair. They had old school nightly wrestling, pro wrestling, uh, entertainment. Sergeant slaughter was the celebrity in the house, but a, a night of great wrestling, but I watched bits and pieces of every match. And that's kind of the one thing that to me sets any performer apart. Are they going to go out there and go through what they've memorized in their mind or are they going to go out there and do kind of do what they have laid out, but are they going to ebb and flow and listen and interact? Cause that's the, the nature of what we do. And, and those kind of matches I had with Nick, it, it literally the, the school of hard knocks, but I had no other choice, but to sit there and listen to him and listen to the people and him kind of talk me through that. Um, it, it is, it is so valuable not to go back into what we, uh, but it's, it's so relevant. You, you kind of watch how the rock forms everything he does. He recognizes the people and the people already know that he's almost got them trained, <laughs> but, but the good season performers, it's the art of what we do. It has so little to do with the move set. It has everything to do with your emotional attachment to the crowd. And Nick was, you know, a, a guy that taught me that. And I'm thankful for it. There's another guy running around on the independence who has an emotional connection with the crowd. And Kid Michael has a question What does Jeff think of MDK during his GCW run? And is he a card carrying member? Of course, MDK is the name of the gang, uh, the uh, phrase that. Uh, Nick Gage uses lovingly for his fan base. What'd you think of Nick Gage, his relationship with the fans and the whole MDK thing? Are you a card carrying member? Of course I am. No, that's up to them. Um, and me and you had conversations. So that would have been in 2021. Cause I was at 20. Yeah. At the end of 2021, uh, kind of thinking about doing, um, a match or two. Yeah, I'm doing a match or two and game changer wrestling. And, um, in 2021, Matt Cardona, uh, was that, the, excuse me. That's the first year he worked for them, I guess. Yeah, that's right. But just the vibe and, and, and me trying to navigate all that, but understanding what game changer wrestling, um, was about is about and Nick's role in it all, um, Obviously, I could easily correlate it to 
ECW, you know, yeah. the, the anti, uh, but it is, it's, it's not ECW. They have their own thread, their own vibe, their own deal. But Nick is somebody that, um, is it fair to say Conrad? He's the face of the brand. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's the face of the brand. And so I did my, uh, as much research as you can do on it and kind of understood that, um, and you know, I saw, uh, Brett and him on that, the show, uh, about addiction and just it, kind of the whole vibe around it. But, um, they're a perfect example of understanding their audience and monetizing it. That I mean, that's well, it, yeah. it, it to me. It's that simple. Brian Wiseman wants to know, and this is a great question. How does a gimmick become part of a long-term character? or a long-term part of a character. The idea being it's been years since Jarrett was the world's greatest singer, yet no one questions why he always has a guitar. Okay. He, if, if you, if you think about and know my history, I carried, I used the guitar and we used it as spots before double J when I was double J world's greatest singer world's greatest entertainer world's greatest wrestler i didn't use the guitar that came in listen up slap nuts don't piss me off my bad don't piss me off which went into listen up slap nuts um you know the world's greatest singer world's greatest entertainer i did a couple of spots on raw playing the guitar brian was my roadie and all that and that's why i think there's such a uh i had a conversation at aw recently about this when people say, Hey man, I, I, I've got a gimmick I'm doing. I understand that. And that's words. I'm playing Mr. Wordsmith here, but the reality is, Hey, what extension of your personality are you going to be? That's the real reality because the guitar now is an extension of my personality, just like double J, just like slap nuts, you know, on, on this podcast, I, I can't tell you how many times people at autograph sessions are like, Simply, it was, you know, they start singing it to me and that's because of you, Conrad. Thanks. But no, the, 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 the personas that resonate with folks, you're really just playing an extension of your personality and gimmick sounds exactly what it is. Oh, it's fake. It's, it's just a gimmick dub deal. It's, there's no authenticity to it at all. Ali wants to know, what is the origin of slap nuts? It's always intrigued me. I still use it to this day. How did it come to be? Told this story a lot. Many times you must be a, my world, uh, not, not a regular listener. Anyway, my grandmother, people called people who, uh, used to say, uh, they know more and more about less and less every day. Basically people who just talked a lot, flap their gums, like to hear themselves talk. Didn't really know shit from China, just uh, whatever. And then, uh, in WCW, it was just, okay. You can call people slappy, but, uh, I went with slap nuts and it was something that just boom took and standards and practices at WCW called me in and said, Hey man, can you give us the definition of slap mutts? We're not sure that should air on cable television. So, um, there you go. Is it in the dictionary now, Conrad? I don't know. I should check that out. Uh, Ben wants to know was a feud between yourself and abyss ever considered in TNA. Both of you were there from the very start, but I don't remember many, if any matches between the two of you. Was it a clash of styles or just something that fell through the cracks? We were both heels. I, I would be for, for the most part of our, 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 our career. You know, I give him, a, uh, we, we give him a hard time on here, yes. but I cannot compliment him enough, uh, on his passion. That's one thing, passion for the business, but, but his, um, well, my confidence in abyss is right up there at the very top many, many times, uh, at TNA wearing the multiple hats that I did, I knew that if abyss was in my segment on any shape, form or fashion that I would go to him most of the time before show day, but say, Hey man, you're involved in this. Will you kind of run pulling on it? We didn't use the word. Maybe I used the word agent, but you know, produce it, agent, uh, whatever it is, let's talk about it. Come to me and abyss knew how to put everyone's piece of the puzzle together. Uh, so he, he just, 
in really, really, really great mind for the business. But uh, I think the short answer is we didn't really wrestle each other because um, we were both heels. I uh, I just did a little search over on cage match. I can only see where you guys ever had two singles matches, one for NWA cyberspace and one on TV for impact in 2010. That I kinda is shocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I can. Wow. One in cyberspace. When I first saw that, you know, when the question I thought to myself, self, <laughs> I know exactly why Jeff didn't do that. I ain't taking no thumbtacks. I ain't going through no <laughs> table. <laughs> No, nope, uh, great question here from Michael. Would Jeff have given up the summer of no worries? If given the chance to be in the invasion angle in 2001, I always thought it would have been awesome to start the whole thing. If he gave Vince a guitar necklace in the ring to start everything off with a bang. Now that's fun. The creative behind that. I know we always say creative subjective, but on the, the simulcast, that's where we saw. Vince McMahon, spell your name out and say that you were fired on national TV. G O double N E gone. <laughs> and if he were then going to be subjected to a WCW invasion, who better than the guy who was publicly fired? And what a cool way to get it kicked off than with a guitar shot. So I know you had, you know, you were intent on taking the summer of 2001 off. It's the summer of no worries. We got a year and we're going to start building this brainstorming idea we had for this new thing. But what if Vince called and said, Hey, why don't you come in? Let's do this invasion thing. That'd have been hard to say no to, no? Well, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, we've stated and discussed this. My contract ran. So I was going to get paid to sit home. That hence the summer of no worries. Yes. I was being paid through the end of October or whatever it was. So that was, I'll call it kind of option A. And knowing the boatload of talent, and I'll just say the Millionaires Club, you know, we could go all Hall, Nash, DDP, Goldberg, Hogan, Savage, whatever. There was a bunch of talent at the very top that Vince had his choice from. And then there were a lot of guys already free. Um, I just knew me kind of doing the jump was in nobody's cards, um, which I was pretty happy with. But <laughs> if the chairman would have called, I'd been an idiot to say no. Because uh, right. I just think there were two stories that could have easily, you know, again, this is a little different era, but crack Vinny Mac or go after stone cold. Both of them could have fit. Michael has a great question. Having watched the Netflix docuseries wrestlers, which by the way is phenomenal. If you're listening to this and you haven't seen it wrestlers on netflix yet go out of your way to see it and encourage your non-wrestling people in the house to watch with you uh I, I can't overstate that i have seen a ton of uh of of accolades and kudos online for this series but i think those are for a lot of people who are quote unquote in the bubble i always have and, and jeff mean you've talked about this before my mom test mm -hmm. my mom will sit down and watch it knowing she's not a wrestling fan, it must be entertaining on a human personal level. And she has that same sort of human interest intrigue with shows like, uh, on HBO, like, uh, hard knocks. So you're, sh you're seeing an NFL team in the preseason, seeing young guys trying to make the cut and make the squad. She loves the story behind the story more than the actual event itself. So I recommend that if you're going to watch wrestlers, don't think, well, I got to go watch it. My man cave by myself. Like I do raw or SmackDown. Have your wife watch with you. I think, I think she'll get, she'll, she'll dig it. Michael says, having watched that, I'm curious if Jeff has ever met or interacted with Matt Jones, given his connection with college sports at UK and now in wrestling, I wondered if you had ever crossed paths. Yes, we have. And I'm trying to think, cause Conrad, we text on this other night and I got to watch that. Uh, I hate to say it. I was doing cardio when I tried to call you earlier, a guy came up and he, and I'm like, Hey, I'm on the phone. Uh, anyway, I got your voicemail, but, uh, that's the question he asked me, have you seen the round? I'm like, yeah, all right. I said I had, and, uh, they went in and, uh, this, my buddy was talking about the wrestler and heels Conrad, are you a heels watcher? 
I watched all of season one. I've only seen episode one of season two, but I'll finish it. You know. Okay. I, I, those are two. I, I think I think you'll like wrestlers a lot more. Okay. It's, uh, it's more of a documentary style. It's not a drama, and it's not shot like a reality show. It's it's produced like a documentary. Got so, it. So you know any of those fabulous series you've seen, like Last Chance You or things like that, it's the same creators as that. Oh wow! So we approach it from almost an ESPN you know, E E 60 or 30 for 30 type approach. It's really, really good. Well done. Hey, the way off topic. Have you seen painkiller, uh, a Netflix, uh, about the, Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that's a six episode or yeah, I watched it all. I sure did. My wife loves all that stuff. Whew. That's heavy. It's the second story about that. I mean, there was one, uh, I think with Michael Keaton a couple of years ago. Okay. I may have actually preferred that one. Okay. Uh, but they were both, they're both outstanding. Yeah. Um, Matthew Broderick played, he's in yep. this, he, yep. he, he is good. Uh, all right. Yes, Matt, I've got a mutual friend that I've got to rack my brain, but I'm a basketball junkie, UK basketball, uh, Matt, you know, just that whole connection that was kind of our, our set point, but yes, yes, I have. So, uh, I'm excited. Um, in that conversation I had this morning, you kind of look at OVW from a, I'll call it, um, a mom perspective. You know, when you hear top line, oh, wow, Cena went there, Brock went there, Batista went there. Oh, at one time, Jim Cornette ran it. Oh, oh, the original dude is Danny Davis, the nightmare. Oh, yeah, when you just hear that lineage. The pedigree, yeah. It is. It to me, wow. And then of course, Shira, um, your man, I love him. I, I, I just, what a human interest story. So anyway, I got to watch it, but yes, I've met Matt. I can't wait to see your reaction. Once you see it, there's some revelations in there, some things that you aren't ready for and you won't expect. And some controversial statements where you're like, wish you wouldn't have said that when the camera was going. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, they definitely try to make some heels and villains. But I'd be curious to see how that affects you because I was unaffected by some of those attempts and others. I was like, Oh, I wish that wasn't in here. Uh, but something I am excited to, t to brag about is that cold Turkey can be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor out in California, uh, or Matt Jones. We're talking about our sponsor fume and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? That's where fume comes in. They're an innovative award nominated device that does just that. You see, instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of vapor fume uses flavored air and instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. You get it instead of bad fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and replace makes, uh, makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume will come with an adjustable airflow dial. It's designed with movable parts and magnets for your fidgeting, giving your fingers something to do to help you de-stress and reduce some anxiety while you're breaking your habit. And I got to admit, my wife was blown away. She said it was way more flavorful than she first thought. It feels very fresh. She really rocks the crisp mint. That's her favorite. They got tons of other great flavors though, including white cranberry and sparkling grapefruit and maple pepper and orange vanilla and raspberry lemon, something for everybody. You'll notice how great it feels in your hand. It's fun to fidget with. It's perfectly balanced. It's well weighted. And man, it's made out of beautiful wood. It's a cool shape. It's a whole vibe. You're going to love the taste and the feel and the look. And by the way, stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching, switching to fume is easy. It's enjoyable. Hell, it's even fun. Fume has served over a hundred thousand customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. So join fume. And accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head on over to tryfume.com and use the code MYWORLD, and you'll save 10% when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfume.com. Use the promo code MYWORLD, you'll save an additional 10% today. Head to tryfume.com slash MYWORLD and use the code MYWORLD to save an additional 10% off your order today. Nathan has a great follow up question about the invasion. If he would have been a part of the invasion, who would he have wanted to face at the pay-per-view in a storyline with? And so you know, who, would you, who would you have wanted to work with on the WWF side? 
Well, I think I've already named him. I mean, I would have loved to have had a match with Vince. Just, what? yeah, just the storytelling. But I'd rather have been the heel. I'd love for him, Vince, to be. He gets that iconic rela- reaction still to this day. You know, it's 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 a unique perspective. He's, I think he's, I do. I think he's the greatest villain in the prof- in the history of professional wrestling. Um, his in in his verbal skills and his inflection, and then his real life set of circumstances and everything that goes around it. It's just. Mr. McMahon's persona is, I don't want to even want to just say a classic heel. It is, but is, it is a, it's an all time villain. Um, but with the right heel, you can flip that. And, you know, I, I just think there could be a lot of fun with Vince as the baby face, uh, stone cold. It, it you know, we worked together in late eighties, early nineties. I would have loved to have had, uh, that, that, match or series of matches. I think we could have drawn money. Sean Berkey wants to know who would you like to play you in your biopic? So when, when the smoothie of your life is made, not that <laughs> slapjack, who, who, who would you want to play you? Oh gosh. That, that is, um, uh, seeing that picture up there from young rock, uh, my man from Australia who figured out a double J accent. Um, Danny DeVito. Wait, well, what do you think? I, I don't, I'll leave that a great in. director. Hey, Conrad, I just did a read for the predators. This cold open. Oh yeah. Um, it was quite fascinating. A New York agency. Okay. And, uh, the producer was British, but they wanted me to speak, uh, with Twang and I'm thinking, uh, isn't this ironic? Let me just read this and the, and the right accent will come out. Anyway, we had a lot of fun doing it. I'm very, uh, happy that the Preds picked me to do it, uh, fired up for this year as every year, but, um, geez, Conrad, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not the one, um, I, you got to put on your serious cause you watch a lot more movies, a lot more movies than I have. Have you got one off the top of your head that would play a good Jeff Jarrett? Bradley Cooper. Okay. Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. That's that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If they're if they're not available, Danny DeVito. <laughs> okay. Crush it, dude. I, what name a movie Danny DeVito has been in that wasn't good. Mm-mm. That's what I'm saying. Mm-mm. He'd have that down pat. <laughs> uh, John wants to know, is Jeff on cordial terms with Dixie? And when was the last time they spoke? Yes, we are. Um, it's got to be when my dad passed away. I think. Yeah. Did you hear from anybody over the, uh, 1000th episode of impact? It, in that, it, as a line of, isn't that ironic? Don't you Am know? I not supposed to ask about that? Oh no, you can't. I, I no, uh, not a peep, uh, from anybody. not a word. I mean, no, not a word. <laughs> Uh, nor when they had their, no, I didn't say like, over the anniversary last year, you mean? but it was, a, that was, a, that location was way is, is a fur piece for my house. Yeah. It's uh what? 20 minutes, maybe <laughs> the when they ran the anniversary show in Nashville at the fairgrounds, the site of Rick players last match. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you didn't get the old invite. <laughs> You stirring, pal. <laughs> well, I'm just asking. I mean, like, does it? I, I'm being sincere. Does it hurt your feelings? I get it. I, 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 I totally understand. Um, that isn't what I asked. Does it hurt your feelings? No, it does not hurt my feelings. It really doesn't because I understand. I'm not sure that I agree with their line of thinking. Um, if they're gonna, and I don't see that. That's that's why I, I, I've I've and I still do it over and over and over, but I got to get out of the uh, assumption business. Um, but I would assume just, but anyway, I've said it over and over and over. I think there's two distinct brands. I think the impact brand really became, as we said, impact LOL. And I think the TNA brand, um, not for everybody, uh, but there, there was more success correlated with that. 
Um, so that that is, you know, bring back folks associated with that era. I think there's an upside to that in so many in so many ways. But I get it. It's their call. It's the powers that be the call. And you know what? It may be the guy at the very tip top. It may be his singular call and say, nope, not doing business with that guy. You know, just, it, just to be clear, you're not saying when you say that people will think you mean Scott Demore. That's not who you mean. Oh gosh. No, no, no. Lynn Asper. Yeah. Yeah. But I just know if we didn't correct that. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Okay. Thank oh, you. Scott Demore has, it's like, that's not a Scott issue. No, 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 no. It's yeah. and what I'm saying is Lynn is, you know, we talk about in the bubble, out of the bubble, Lynn and rightly so he's never been anywhere close to the bubble. And right. so I, 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 uh, I respect that. I guess what I'm saying is that's why it doesn't hurt my feelings. I respect Lynn's decision. If it's his decision, it's none of my business, but I, I respect that. Robert wants to know a lot of criticism that TNA receives is due to relying on quote unquote WWE guys on camera. Do you think a real problem was relying on guys behind the camera who weren't totally bought in? And he lists potentially Bruce, Eric, and Cornette. Maybe they were there who were just for guys who were there just for a job and didn't totally believe in TNA. I've seen that over the last few months where people would tweet that at us saying the issue wasn't necessarily bringing in WWE guys like Booker T or Christian. The issue was that perhaps a lot of the decision makers behind the scenes only viewed the WWE guys as stars, like the only stars. Or the WWE guys. So he said the suggestion, the narrative is Jeff, if you weren't on raw or SmackDown or WrestleMania or the Royal rumble or SummerSlam, where you're not really a top guy, you're just a guy down here in the minor leagues. And perhaps the assumption is that guys like Bruce or Eric or Cornette, maybe they handled guys like AJ that way or Samoa Joe that way versus maybe the way they handled Booker T and Christian and Kurt angle and those type guys. What say you? Is that a fair criticism? Is there something there? Let me think. My, this is why I love this podcast. Cause you know, would I, this thought ever have run through my mind today? No, but I mean, you're asking me, Conrad, the audience of one, I'll just say that, you know, Help me out, Conrad. What 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 does that mean? The WWE up until last Tuesday, really everything was done through the filter. Whether you were a cameraman, whether you were on camera or off, whether you slept the office floor or worked in photography or worked in creative services, ultimately you're really working for events. Yes. When the power play took place at the end of 09 between Jeff Jarrett, and Dixie Carter, it became the audience of one and everybody that came into the company was working for her, her and made decisions based on either what she said or what they thought she wanted. And look, I know for a fact, and me and Eric, I, you know, look, I, I don't think Eric looks on his TNA days as fine or impact days as fond days, but I do believe he got up and came to work and made the best possible decision that he thought that was for the day that, that whether I agreed with it or disagree with it, that was irrelevant. He was doing what he thought. And that is what, how can I make my boss Dixie Carter happy? And every decision was that made that way. The lack of communication between Dixie and her group and her group was Dean Broadhead, Vince Russo, Bruce Pritchard, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. I think those five never really knew what the other was thinking or talking. It was such a disjointed lack of communication, chaos at the top. Um, but Dixie, bless her heart. I just said she sent nice texts and all this, but we're just talking business and all the water under the bridge. If Jeff went left, then I need to go right. If Jeff went right, I'm going to go left. You just kind of look at the entire organization. I mean, across the board, Jeff went six sided ring. We got to go four sided ring, whether it was Hulk's idea or Dixie's idea, Dixie made the final say on everything. It was on talent 
hey, here's Jeff's crop of talent. Let's get rid of them all. Here's Jeff's crop of agents. Let's get rid of them all. It was a complete, when you look at the company from July of, uh, of 09 until July of 11, it's not, it, it doesn't resemble at all the same, it, not even close. So I don't believe that is the, ultimately it falls on the leader's shoulders. Like any organization, it falls squarely on her shoulders. Bruce, look, at that time he was the, and Conrad, you may help me better than this. I mean, Bruce was the outside looking in at WWE. WWE was not on his radar. Is that That's right. So, I yeah. mean, he, he wasn't making a decision based on WWE. Eric wasn't making that decision. Um, you I know, think the implication is, though, that these guys were not really all in. They felt like I've worked in the major leagues. I've been at WrestleManias and SummerSlams and the Nitro era and the Monday Night Wars. This, no matter how we try to frame it, it's a step down. So therefore I'm not as excited. I'm not as motivated. I'm just sort of here for a check passing the time. Did so, you ever feel like some of the guys were that way? There were there's phone of, um, uh, what's it mailing it in. So here was kind of my perception of that. That's what Dixie thought. Okay. And I, and I say that with all due respect that, Whatever was built over the last seven years, oh, well, they're saying, you, you know, they just, th there was no, like, I, I I had been to WCW and WWF and had success. But in my mind, hell no, we're not WWE, but rightly so, we're the alternative. We, we are building our own brand and our own paychecks and our own uh, promotion and our own culture. And, and, and I'm damn happy to do it. And let's count, keep, keep on moving down this track. Did I, I, I said it many, many times. No guys, we're not number two. We're the alternative, but we yeah. make a lot of freaking money being the alternative and the opportunities will continue to come our way. If we stay the course and they were, and look, were we selling out arenas? No, but were we making money? Yes, we were. Uh, and so I think the simple term was, Having a little gratitude of where we were at was was not um, in Dixie's mindset. Unfortunately, that that to me is is how I viewed it. If, if she she I don't uh, you know for whatever reason, just the radical changes put us in the financial death spiral. That is those are facts. Well, here's a question that uh, feels like it's from the DVDR sleaze thread from back in the day. <laughs> feel bad for even asking it oh you do not here we go no, i do because it's about somebody who's no longer with us who you and i both held in high regard but this has been out there long enough and nobody's ever officially addressed it and squashed it i assume it's going to be squashed here we go aldo 13 s says there are some rather seedy stories relating to bob Ryder and some of the boys in tna and it suggested that he abused his position of power exchanging favors for pushes without going into further detail can Jeff provide any comment on these stories? And Jeff, I'm not saying that's accurate, but I am saying that was all, that was message board fodder 25 years ago. Yeah. And I don't know that it was fair and I don't know what you can share, but the, the floor is yours to respond to that. However you'd like. I think I text you this over the weekend, not about Bob Ryder, but about when you're successful. Yeah. That with that comes criticism fair or unfair um i'll say this and and you know i think bob would chuckle at this today uh him hearing this but whether it's me and jb or who or abyss you know um the banny rooster at times would rear his ugly head and bob felt very very attached to the brand because he was there day one from day one. And so Bob's style of, of doing business or negotiating, I'll call it territorial. And so I think a lot of times Bob would use the words my, or it, 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 it would come across wrong and not so much we as in my, and he ruffled feathers a lot of times with folks, but he also came from that the, I'll call it that message board world. And, and 
you know, now today we would know it is Reddit. It can get very opinionated and can kind of go off the deep end like Twitter, like any form of social media, but Bob, um, so, so silly rumors, but I heard them as well too. My dad actually came up to me one time and kind of addressed all that. And I said, dad, go, go have a conversation with Bob and you'll know. He goes, I know, but Bob just gets, gets himself so wound up. And I mean, Bob would literally on those contracts that Panda would make him sign, you know, talent would come in on the asylum for one-offs and they, uh, um, Panda didn't want anybody going to the ring unless they had signed the release. Yeah. Bob's job was to do that. Sometimes Bob had to get a little wiry to get those things done. Like you're going to sign this or you can't go out on the TV. And look, we, of course we would back him up, but Bob would take matters into his own hands and get a little bit out of shape. And that's where the, the term little Banny rooster, he'd get a little upset and, uh, cackle a little bit, but no, the, it's all BS. Well, let's debunk something else or let's confirm it. Uh, this is a controversial one. Teddy says, does Jeff have any heat or issues with Vampiro? I was watching the Vampiro documentary on Tubi and I noticed him and Jarrett having words at the AAA show. Now, if this is the same documentary I saw, I think this is the AAA show where you I think the phrase you like to use is fell out of the canoe, tip the canoe, tip the canoe. And that called on, it's obviously not a red letter day. It was a bad day. Yeah. I look back on it. And I mean this out of all sincerity. It's one of the days that began to wake me up. Hmm. It is certainly one of those days that I look back on and I'll call it in the first year of sobriety. It's one of those days that you just beat just like how in the world did I break my cardinal rule and start drinking before I got to the show and then drink at the show. But as you work through that, I realized that Valley had to happen in order to get me sober and yeah. move it in the right direction, period. And Unfortunately, or fortunately for old vamp, he was on the other end of that, but no, I've worked with him since and look all talent. We're going to have our good days and our bad days, but no, uh, what the, the exact question? Cause I always like to make sure your answer is do I have any heat with him? The answer is no. Does he have any heat with me? No, I may have heat with him, but he doesn't have any with me. <laughs> uh, we'll do two more and then we'll wrap this one up. Ghost quest wants to know, has a fan ever said something to you during a match or promo that made you break character? Oh gosh. Um, Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they have, I don't remember any certain circumstances, but I always like when let's just say the crazy uncle is giving it back to double J or the last outlaw or really engaging. And I kind of fire it back at them and maybe get a, a, a one up on the him and, and, that certain crazy uncle sort of, I'll say, sinks back into their chair and the whole family gets a laugh out of it. Th those are the things that break me, that I go, ooh, <laughs> I got him, but I didn't realize I got him that good in front of his family. So, no, those, but no, um, yes, it happens. It happens more, um, it happened more back in the day at spot shows and, stuff like that, non-televised uh, events, but sure. F the, the fan interaction is always so spontaneous. You never know what you're going to get. When you, I like when you do over the top and you become the double J character, the last outlaw you had a, when you just walked in the building at Starcast before Ric Flair's last match, that same weekend, some guy started talking shit to you and you went full blown character mode. And I mean, I had no less than six people who worked for Starcast who came to get me to see if I would come get you to calm down. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they showed me the video and I just looked at them and I go, everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my favorite, I almost got you to crack when we were at Starcast when you and I were jaw jacking back and forth, 
there was one time where you looked at me and I could tell it was everything you had not to laugh. I don't even remember what got it, but I remember we locked eyes once and you non-verbally said, you motherfucker, give me just a minute. Well, I can tell you this much. <laughs> when our better halves took it to another level. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it went to a fever pitch, but as it began to kind of subside, I think I might have caught your eye and going, yeah, pal, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> you sure you want to promote this show? <sighs> Egan beating the shit out of Karen and Karen dropping F-bombs. And yeah, I mean, as she's getting pulled away, I'll <laughs> fucking kill you. Plain as day on the pay-per-view. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. All right, one last one. We'll end on a high note. Uh, it's been a while since we've we've done this, but Richie Ray says, do you still have the letter your dad wrote talking about love and appreciation of one another? Yes. Yeah, yeah I've got a, a, a couple of um, letters. He wrote me a letter. Uh that was during my time before I went to WCW the first time. Look, we lived, I don't know, 600 yards apart, 700 yards apart, but he wrote me a letter. It was short, but anyway, yeah, I do, Richie. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, and you know, that's that's something that I am. Folks, we're going to end on this, but if there is a relationship you have in your life right now, that somebody did you wrong and they're a hundred percent in the wrong. That is somewhat delusional. Let's say they're 99% in the wrong. At some point you're in, in engaged in it, make amends because buddy, there is a awesome feeling in reconciling relationships because, uh, I am so grateful I did with my dad, uh, several, several years ago. But, um, you know, I think about, man, how lucky I am that I got to reconcile with him. Uh, last few years were great. And, uh, that's how I remember. It. Well, we appreciate the time today. We did a little hashtag ask Jeff anything. We'll be back with our regularly scheduled programming next week. In the meantime, you can catch us on YouTube. That's my world on youtube.com. You can also catch lots of great, uh, merch and swag and things like that for us over at box You can advertise here on the program at advertise with and we'd love to have your feedback and your questions. We're pretty active on all forms of social media. It's at my world pod. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday and every Tuesday right here on my world. Peace. Eric Bischoff here again, telling you about our friends over at save with Conrad.com. Now Conrad's always talking about how they are helping homeowners save money. But did you know that Conrad and his team can also help you become a homeowner? They make the home buying process more enjoyable than, I don't know, making out with Stephanie and Linda. Ouch, but don't take my word for it. I'm Willie Proctor, and I'm from Martinsburg, West Virginia. I came with uh, Save with Conrad to buy my first home. Is that once I, you know, listened to the podcast, or I was I heard other testimonials and uh, how easy it was. So and that was the whole process for me here was wanting for convenience. Oh, it was a, it was a pleasure. I mean, it was like working with family. It really was like. You know, being from West Virginia, you know, it's it's all about family here. And, and that's what it was like working with Conrad's team. You know, I worked with Larry, uh, Holly, and Francis. And they were just, it was just like, I, I thought I was talking to my aunt or, you know, talking to my dad. You know, <laughs> it was it was a great experience. Yeah, this is actually the house I grew up in. So that was kind of the whole thing. And my mom was moving to South Carolina. You know, she was, and she got stressed out about what to do with the house, how she was going to sell it, uh, get rid of everything. And I thought, you know what, I didn't want to see the house go. But at the same time, I wanted to make the process easy for me and easy for my mom. And working with Larry and the team, uh, they made it easy for both of us. Uh, hi, this is Willie Proctor, and I just bought my first house with SaveWithConrad.com. And unlike the dirt sheets, we're not making this up. Check out all the five-star reviews. Go to SaveWithConrad.com and do it today. Be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo!